Hey class, so I've uh, assigned homework three on e-learning, so that's up there and available now. There were no updates to the notes this week, so you're not missing out on that. Uh, I had originally intended to spend the whole lecture uh, discussing um, uh, a, a few topics. Uh, I was going to implement uh, the spanning tree algorithms that are that have placeholders for them in the notes uh, and other algorithms. But um, I realized that uh, that's still not quite in the spirit of what I had hoped to do uh, with this middle third of the semester. Um, really, I, I wanted to, um, to give you kind of the introduction that I give uh, whenever we have a, a new developer join a, a team that I'm on. Um, so it's always the first day ramp up and um, Really, it's it's just an overview of all of the things that you need to install, and then um, uh, like a, a brief overview of the code and and so forth. And it all happens kind of fast, and so um, it, even that, you know, even with the my desire to go over that, uh, it's still not going to be as fast and as intense as what you'll get uh, on your first day of work. <clears throat> In particular, that's a, an eight-hour day, uh, and so you'll be kind of drained uh, at the end of the day. Uh, so we're going to do a, a much shorter version of that. I think we'll probably do it for maybe, um, I, I don't know, something like 30 minutes or so, uh, and then um, you know, we'll jump off of that. Uh, but you know, uh, we, we may do it for even less than that. Um, OK, so whenever you start your work so you you go through the interview process and then uh, you start your day um, they'll probably have you sit with one of the senior developers um, you'll uh, they'll give you a, a list of things that you need to install uh, if you have um, if you're fortunate enough to work on uh, a team that's a little further along uh, a little more mature then they will have pre-installed a lot of the stuff that you need already on your machine and hopefully uh, if uh, if you've had the benefit of you know, going through your senior project and uh, picking something that's going to challenge you a little bit uh, then you should be familiar with it now in my case I, I did you know try to find my way into development for me uh, the act of writing software was easier than taking exams it was, it was uh, definitely not the case by my freshman year, uh, but um, once I got into it, once I'd had a, a little bit of success, uh, I realized that I, I much preferred writing code to studying for exams. Um, so, uh, but even with that, I, I ended up uh, doing all of my undergraduate work in C and C++, and then whenever I finally got a job, it was in uh, Microsoft.net. I thought, okay, well, <laughs> you know, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd kind of avoided that, you know, whatever, um, you know, uh, I, I thought, well, who better to manage my own memory than me, the programmer, the, the developer? Uh, I don't want something that has some garbage collector, you know, coming around and, uh, you know, taking up precious resources. I want to optimize my code and everything. Um, but the reality is that uh, both, both Java and uh, C Sharp or, or .NET uh, are, are really good. It's it's really good. Uh, you have more uh, idle clock cycles than you think or, or than you worry about. Uh, and if you don't, then uh, your program is being just a little too aggressive uh, in terms of uh, consuming uh, processor resources. There should be, um, as you're developing and, and as your, uh, your methods improve and you become uh, more professional and, and more a master of your trade, uh, you'll find um, that a lot of your work deals with, um, you know, uh, placing requests on hold and then allowing a thread to pick it up whenever. Uh, and so for the most part, the development that you're going to do, if you're, if you're doing web development, if you're doing uh, any kind of uh, user interface development, you know, something that gets installed on the computer and executed. Um, if you're doing game development, uh, you know, basically, if, if you're doing any kind of development other than, um, 
you know, something that uh, is, is extremely time intensive. Uh, so uh, the only thing I can think of is like stock trading or something, right? Like where, where you're spending millions, you know, tens of millions of dollars to get real estate close to the stock exchange so that you can get this one microsecond advantage uh, in putting in, you know, in processing and then putting in the, the buy and sell requests. Uh, you're just trying to beat everyone by having a, a shorter length cable to the stock exchange. Well, okay, yeah, then in that case, you're probably going to want your resources to be as intense as possible. But in almost every other case, uh, you're going to be interacting with the user uh, or you're going to be developing software that's on a machine that's running other applications or other processes in the background. And when that's the case, uh, you want to be a, a good neighbor to the other processes. Uh, for your user, you want to make sure that you have a, a responsive system. Uh, and so typically that'll follow a pattern where you have a thread that manages updating the UI so that the user feels whenever they click something, they see something happen, right? Like there's a, this uh, shading of the button so that it indicates that it's been pressed or, uh, you know, uh, the cursor gets placed inside the text box. Uh, and when that doesn't happen, the user, um, is going to get frustrated really quickly. Just reach into your own bag of experiences for that. Uh, so already, like just before you've actually done anything and just taking the, the data, uh, you already have to separate that. Uh, and so uh, one of the great things about browser development is that the developers of the web browser deal with that particular issue in, in terms of uh, separating um, the processing thread from uh, the, the thread that manages the user interface. Um, so that's fantastic. Uh, and um, one of the reasons that I, I pushed for JavaScript, even though it's, you know, I'll admit it's a weird language, right? So if you're learning C or C++, uh, the JavaScript, um, it's, it's different. Uh, but uh, it, um, it's asynchronous, it's, it's single threaded, which you know, it, it doesn't seem like it would be all that great for parallel computation. And, and in that regard, it's not great for parallel computation. But in terms of asynchronous programming, it's fantastic. Uh, and whenever you get used to that, um, then uh, your mindset in, in how to deal with tasks that can be written in parallel, whether you're writing in Java or uh, C Sharp, or uh, if you uh, want to deal with uh, the uh, POSIX threads in C++ or, or C, uh, then uh, you will have a, a, a better foundation for that. Um, so uh, starting out, um, I would recommend that as far as like software, uh, the languages that you learn, uh, I would recommend at least dipping your toes in the water for either C Sharp or Java uh, because it's uh, it's managed code, and, and what that means is that um, you can forget about the variables that you declare, right? So uh, whenever you're writing in C, uh, so long as you're not doing any malloc requests, uh, you're not requesting memory on the heap, uh, then whenever you you leave a function, any variable that you declared. Uh, whether it was one of the input parameters to the function or if it was a variable that was declared inside a loop or if it was a variable that was declared at the top of the function, uh, it comes off of memory. So all is forgiven as soon as you leave the function. Uh, if you uh, make a malloc request or in C++ if you make a, a new request, right, like new list or new node or whatever, uh, then that lives uh, until you tell it to go away. Uh, and on the one hand, uh, if you're a control freak, uh, that, that's fantastic. Uh, it's exactly what you want. Uh, but if you, uh, if you still feel like you're trying to find the rhythm of development and there's, it feels like there's just a, a lot going on uh, to understand at the moment, you know, that's fine. We all, we all go through that phase. Uh, there's, there's no way around it other than to write more code. Uh, and uh, hopefully to write enough code that you write bad code, and the bad code uh, is, is really the lesson. Uh, that's whenever you, uh, you get personally invested in it. Either uh, you get really frustrated with it, 
uh, or it just doesn't work and you end up spending hours just chasing down the issue and you wonder if you're ever going to be able to do it and then you get that eureka moment and it's like okay well you never forget that lesson right uh, and so uh, there's there's no way around it you know no one uh, you know whatever they tell you there's no phenom or whatever uh, the the people that are, are great developers um, they just put in those you know hundreds of hours you know really early on uh, and they get this aura or you know this effect that makes it look like they're they're just better at it well you know they're not you know we uh, you know a anyone the the people that I've met that are good at, at developing software are just the people that uh, enjoyed it enough to put in the time to get good um, and if it's uh, you know if it's something that makes you break out in hives or uh, you know you start having a panic attack or uh, you know, vomiting profusely or whatever, right? <laughs> whatever type of ill effects you have, uh, that you know, maybe, maybe uh, you won't enjoy putting in that time. Uh, but if you're in my class and and you've made it this far, uh, and you know, uh, if you uh, if you were able to survive, you know, calculus and, and intro to programming, uh, then you've got what it takes. You've got the framework. Uh, you just um, you just got to put in the time. Uh, okay, so uh, I, we spoke about you know jumping into your first day, right? And so before you actually start the job, you have to interview, right? So I, I have another question uh, that I was given in an interview, uh, and uh, I wanted to uh, to present it to you. Uh, so we'll we'll do the intro. Uh, I'll give you the problem, and then uh, at the end of the lecture, we'll go back and we'll solve it. Uh, using that weird JavaScript, right? <laughs> uh, okay, uh, okay, so the problem's pretty simple. Uh, we've been talking about graphs, and we've been talking about trees, and we said that we would go through the pre-order and in-order and uh, post-order traversal, and um, uh, and then uh, graphs, you know, also present uh, other opportunities, right, with breadth-first and, and depth-first searches. Uh, so here's the problem. Uh, okay, so we have this tree. It's got a few nodes in it, uh, and we can extend it, you know, to any level. But usually, uh, you know, the three distinct levels is is enough to kind of uh, get the point across without spending a ton of time building up the tree, right? Uh, okay, so uh, first of all, write a program that represents this tree in memory. Okay, uh, so we've already done a little bit of that, right? Like you. Uh, as soon as I said that, you should say, okay, well, I'm going to need something to represent a node, right? Uh, and then uh, it's sufficient to maintain a root node. You don't actually need a, a tree object necessarily, right? It's, it's enough to maintain a root. Uh, the tree is a luxury object in my opinion. Uh, but yeah, if you want a, a tree, sure, you know, whatever. It's, it, it's however you solve it, right? I, I should, I've already helped too much, right? Uh, anyway, uh, so... Right, represent this in memory. Okay, and then once you do that, once you've satisfied the interviewer, or whatever, uh, then uh, write a program that will print out each of the values in this tree. Okay, uh, and then once you do that, okay, uh, we're gonna extend the problem. Uh, okay, so now I want you to print this out uh, in uh, like, I don't want you to sort it, right? I want your algorithm to visit these nodes, right? And we'll talk about design patterns, right? And, and the visitor pattern is one of them, right? Uh, but I want you to uh, write a program that visits these nodes uh, in the order uh, that, uh, just in, in sorted order, right? From least to greatest, right? So 
5, then 10, then 15, then 20, 25, 30, and 35. Uh, and then, you know, uh, to write a, a program that visits it, you know, uh, in uh, uh, pre-order, in order, and post-order, right? So subsequently. Uh, and, okay, so it, it seems like a lot, uh, but by the time you've been writing software for a few years, um, you yeah, know, you should be able to do this in, uh, I mean, these interviews typically take anywhere from like 20 to 30 minutes or whatever. So. They give you a little bit of time. It'll it'll take a little bit of time, and uh, you know there's the pressure and, and everything of uh, having to write code in front of everyone else, right? Like, oh my gosh, you know I can barely get this stuff to compile. Whatever, I'm by myself in a dark room now. I have to do it with people watching. Yeah, okay, you know it's a little uncomfortable, but the the interviewer understands that, right? And then uh, also uh, developers, you know. Uh, you know, you never want to lay a blanket statement, but we tend to be introverts, uh, and so you know they also understand that there's this like sense of wanting to keep your your code private and everything, um, and so it's it's kind of uh, like they know it's it's a little hard to share at first, but um, you've got time, right? And they can generally tell, you know, if you're just nervous, uh, and uh, they'll they'll allow for that. Uh, but by the end of 30 minutes, it's pretty obvious whether or not the other person has has written code, or you know if uh, if not. Right? Uh, and so I, I think it's important. So it, you, know, <laughs> you got to get good grades in order to get the interview. But if you want to get the job, you have to have experience actually writing code. Like there's there's no way around it. I personally never recommend hiring anyone if you know <laughs> if they can't. Um, if they can't code at all, right? Like you, um, I want to see that you put in the time to do what it is that you're you're asking me to let you do for two thousand hours a year. Uh, okay, well, you know, have you have you done it for a hundred hours, right? I mean, that's only two and a half weeks at forty hours a week, right? So that's um, <laughs> have you done two and a half weeks of work in in your entire you know developing life? Um, so. Uh, yeah, like that's. I think that's a fair question for an interview. So anyway, we'll we'll come back. We'll do that later. Uh, and then one of the themes that you'll you'll see that I'm I'm pushing you to adopt uh, is um, just this willingness to throw away code, right? Like it, um, it. I know what an achievement it is to to get code that finally compiles or you know works that finally actually you can use it to solve something, uh, and. It feels great. That's why I became a developer. But um, uh, yeah, that uh, you gotta let that go, right? You don't hold on to, to all of your programs uh, as you're going. Uh, eventually, you need to, you know, to be willing to throw it away, right? Uh, and so that's that's not distinct to software development either. Right? So uh, if you look at the the making of, you know. Uh, any uh, uh, of animated movies, uh, they they use storyboards and they're constantly changing it and they're throwing it away, uh, and you know there as well, like they're putting in a, a lot of creative energy and you have to let it go. You can't really take it personally, and you know even though you spent a lot of time on it, you know uh, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You got to get rid of it, right? And so the idea, it's not just the ability to do it; it's the ability to do it and do it and do it over and over again to achieve the same thing, to achieve one thing, right? And so even, you know, uh, so fine, like even beyond making movies and and developing software and, uh, uh, <laughs> and you know, authorship, writing stories as well, uh, whenever you're developing, uh, if you're constructing a boat, um, you know, the, the old ship makers, uh, they would develop this framework, this scaffolding, and then they would throw away the scaffolding. You know, afterwards, it, it was just there to kind of support the general structure of what the frame of the ship would eventually be. Uh, and you know, the same thing with uh, masonry as well, right? Like you build up the scaffolding so that you can, you know, use it to support some structure, and then you tear it down. Um, and so that's that's part of it, and, and it's in every aspect of you know, the professional world it's it's not enough to be able to get to do it once like you have to be willing you know to, to do it over and over again so uh, yeah it, it feels great whenever it finally works um, 
but you know uh, as you put in the hours uh, you know learn to um, learn to throw away some code uh, it, it's fine you know just build it up really quickly uh, you know I, that's one of the reasons I, I like these uh, scripting languages is because you don't even have to compile it like you can just uh, open up the interpreter uh, write a, a loop and assign a few variables or whatever you know get your answer and then you know throw it away um, so yeah just be, be willing to, to move at speed and, and to uh, take up a cause and, and let it go uh, just uh, as part of your craft uh, okay so we'll come back and we'll answer that we'll, we'll do some coding a, a little bit later uh, so first day all right you, you passed the interview you got the job uh, now it's time to install some software right let's discuss this a little bit uh, okay so you uh, are lucky enough to go to a school that uh, has a deal with uh, Microsoft uh, which they, they had it when I was an undergraduate uh, and Microsoft has a ton of software uh, and um, the ones that uh, I was most familiar with were uh, SQL Server uh, and Visual Studio right uh, I guess we have Visual Studio Enterprise uh, I think it's enough to have Visual Studio Professional I'm sure it's on here somewhere um, and then uh, Visual Studio Code which I use whenever I'm doing front-end development. Right. Uh, so that's enough to get going. Uh, you're going to have a lot of questions in part because there's just so much software to consider. There's other stuff. Uh, you're going to have, you know, the opportunity for other stuff that you use in other classes. I know uh, Visio is used for like diagramming stuff, um, and yeah, that's that's good too. Uh, but once I got out in the professional world, basically everything I did was with uh, SQL Server and uh, Visual Studio Pro. Uh, I did use Access one time, but um, yeah, that's uh, um, uh, I would I I would jump ahead to SQL Server um, and bypass Access. Uh, it's like a database file, but like, you can only use it by one person or whatever, right? So it's not anything that you would use necessarily at a professional level. Uh, I think it's, um, you know, I, I'm sure it has a purpose, but I, I can't sit here and, and advocate for it, right? Uh, not <laughs> to you, right? Uh, okay, so, uh, so SQL Server, and then if you can find Visual Studio Pro somewhere, do that. Uh, they have other stuff as well. Are you know, feel free to talk to the tech team and figure out how to get your login set up so you can start downloading uh, the software uh, that'll get you going. Um, so there's a, a ton of options, but um, you know, those are the three that I would recommend. Visual Studio uh, Pro or Enterprise if they don't have that. Uh, Enterprise is a step above Pro, um, so yeah, <laughs> that's fine as well. Right? Uh, SQL Server and then uh, Visual Studio Code. Uh, and yeah, we'll we'll do some stuff with uh, VS Code uh, later on. I, I do intend future lectures to go over some of the front end stuff. Um, so we'll deal with that whenever we get there. Uh, let's see. Uh, so it may be uh, it's been a while since I've installed Visual Studio uh, that uh, you can install the .NET framework as part of it, um, but you might also have to install it separately, so feel free to look it up and then install that. Um, .NET Core is is awesome. So it's basically, it, it's the equivalent of uh, .NET 4.8. Uh, and then sometime, I, I thought it was this month actually, uh, that they were gonna release .NET 5.0. Uh, and so, um, like, okay, what's what's the deal with all of the different releases and, and so forth? Uh, okay, so by convention, you know, uh, these software frameworks, um, whenever they change this first number, right, from three to four, it's a, a major revision, uh, and it's not guaranteed to not break your stuff, right? So double negative, uh, it it might break your stuff, right? So it's a it's a big deal to update. Uh, your dependencies um, so you want to watch out for that but uh, with .NET 5 um, 
it's a merging of .NET Core and .NET Framework. .NET Core um, works on uh, on all sorts of uh, on on all of the major operating systems. It works on Linux. It works on uh, Mac, and it works on uh, Windows, which uh, is why the last several projects I've done have have used .NET Core. Um, and then additionally, they, they had some features that may have been available with .NET Framework, and I just wasn't familiar with it. But whenever you're developing a, a web API, uh, for uh, just allowing really easy security features, um, and so in terms of uh, restricting access to certain endpoints based on certain privileges that you define. Uh, and if we have time, and, and it looks like we might, uh, before the end of the semester, we'll look over a, a simple API that deals with uh, JWT authentication, uh, which, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's fine. You know, I didn't encounter it until uh, fairly recently in my career, so uh, you know, don't worry about it. There's there's uh, a lot to take in, and um, it it tends to take. Uh, years to, to accumulate the knowledge but if I can shave some of that time off for you by uh, kind of walking you along some of it then uh, I will uh, anyway so uh, this is the version that runs on uh, Windows Mac and uh, Linux uh, and this is the version that runs just on Windows uh, with .NET 5 uh, they're merging uh, so that uh, essentially everything that was available on the, the Windows only version is now going to be available on all of the other systems and uh, vice versa those uh, yeah those, those features are now available on every platform uh, which is fantastic so I'm, I'm personally looking forward to .NET 5 uh, coming out um, and that'll happen sometime soon so as soon as it does I would recommend that you start if you're going to do any C Sharp development that you do it on that uh, and so uh, C Sharp has um, yeah, similar uh, uh, capabilities uh, to Java, so they're uh, they're not interchangeable, right? Like if you write code for one, it, it won't work on the other. Uh, but uh, some of the concepts, like the the uh, the managed memory, the fact that there's a, a garbage collector that goes in and cleans up the objects for you. Uh, once there's no longer any references to them, uh, you know that's uh, that's similar. Um, and then uh, the fact that uh, Java runs on a, a virtual machine or the the JVM, uh, it's it's like a, a pseudo virtual machine, uh, but uh, it it's its own kind of operating system. So it uh, the JVM will have its own memory management system and uh, so forth. Uh, and the reason they do that is this it's this layer of indirection. And, and we'll talk about it again whenever we talk about virtual machines and, uh, and containers, like Docker containers. Um, but by creating the JVM, they've, uh, they were able, and this was pretty revolutionary whenever it came out in, I guess, the 90s, uh, they were able to uh, create this programming language where uh, you are always programming against the same operating system, no matter what system you are running on, and then uh, they, the the Java team would spend their efforts uh, creating a JVM for these different platforms, uh, so that you would have one JVM that uh, it it compiled against a Sun machine, and then another one that compiled against a Windows operating system, and then another one for uh, you know, for Apple and uh, another one for Linux. Uh, and so the features and the behavior of the JVM was identical uh, on all of these different systems, but the code required to actually create the JVM itself was distinct. But it, it was like this adapter, uh, and uh, it allowed the same Java code, the same byte code, uh, to be executed on all of these different systems uh, and in doing so. Uh, and so uh, Microsoft, um, whenever uh, they first came out with uh, .NET, uh, they went in the other direction. They wanted to support multiple programming languages like Visual Basic, uh, uh, Visual Basic VB.NET, uh, and uh, C Sharp, and F Sharp, and 
I think they might have like a J sharp or something like that. Uh, and so all of these different languages, and then it compiles to a common intermediate language. Uh, and that intermediate language runs on the, the CLR, the common language runtime. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's this almost executable code that kind of sits there. And then uh, there's a, a just-in-time compiler that goes through and it takes this uh, thing that looks a, a lot like bytecode. And then it, it finally compiles it at the last second. Uh, that's the, where it gets its name is just-in-time compilation. Uh, and then it, it remains compiled throughout the execution of the program, but it there's a, a little bit of overhead, but it's not really felt by the application. Anyway, uh, so it was, uh, but then the CLR would only run on Windows machines originally. So uh, Java was one language that could uh, be executed on, on any operating system. And the CLR, the .NET, uh, was uh, many languages that could be executed on a single operating system. Uh, and so now, uh, I really don't know if every language is supported, but C Sharp, which is, in my opinion, the best one uh, on of the, the .NET family, uh, is now supported on, on multiple uh, operating systems. And so it's fantastic. I've, I've written it specifically to execute on Linux machines, and then I've, I've toyed around with getting it to work on Mac as well. Uh, and uh, it, yeah, I, I can recommend it. It's a, a solid language. Um, so I, I've used Java sparingly, but uh, you know, uh, I drew inspiration from uh, the people that were willing to pay me money to write software, <laughs> and and each of those jobs uh, was was in C sharp, uh, and then uh, I kind of grew to love it. So now I consider it as my uh, it's my primary programming language. Uh, but I've been doing a lot of work in uh, JavaScript because um, I've, uh, I didn't spend a lot of time early in my career uh, making things uh, that could be presented to a user. Uh, mostly I, I focused on uh, developing stuff that would run on a server uh, and then, uh, but more recently I, I've tried to extend myself. Uh, and so uh, JavaScript is, is very beneficial in that because HTML, uh, in keeping with the spirit of, of .NET Core and, the, and Java, uh, it's supported on every operating system, right? Like every operating system that a user is, is going to, uh, to encounter uh, is going to provide a web browser. Uh, you know, there's certain exceptions for the most hard uh, hardened individuals of our craft where uh, they're uh, logging into these headless servers using some terminal or whatever uh, and you know that's fine they're not going to be browsing the web but you know those types of individuals are also going to be able to write their own scripts and programs so they're not really the people you're targeting for for almost any application you would be releasing uh, and so I tend to favor whenever recommending um, you know, uh, a platform to develop on. Uh, to start with HTML, uh, HTML and JavaScript and, and CSS, because it's so, uh, it, it gets you that 80% with 20% of the effort, right? Like, and it's just a, a broad stroke that allows you to, um, to get started and cover a lot of ground in, in the minimal amount of time. Uh, but uh, certainly, uh, if you want to target devices natively, uh, you know you can work uh, on Android devices, or uh, you can work on iOS or uh, whatever you know directly. And uh, you know, with with native uh, programming comes uh, uh, the full feature set of the device, uh, and so that's the trade-off. You can use everything if you work directly against it, uh, but it's such a narrow scope um, that I feel you have to justify some need. There has to be something that the device can only do with a native feature set uh, in order to justify going that direction. Uh, unless uh, you've reached the point in your career where you're just looking for something to, to keep you sharpened, right? to keep your skills sharpened, and, and you need something you've never done before that'll kind of challenge you. Uh, then by all means, you know, take take on uh, that that new challenge. But I think whenever you're getting started, um, 
a good deal of the work that you're doing is in uh, marketing. It's uh, marketing yourself is uh, finding something that has broad enough appeal that will um, uh, that you can you know you can show your work and and you can show that you can come on and and help. Uh, but uh, you know, selfishly, you should be considering like you also want to go to places that uh, you can continue to learn as well, um, so that you know further down the line you have even more opportunities um but anyway uh so uh my recommendation is if you're going to start a project uh i would recommend doing something that that has that broad appeal uh but you, know, you don't have to be restricted to that right? uh okay so we've discussed uh net um then uh if you're going to use linux uh then uh, my recommendation for that would be Ubuntu. Uh, it's uh, it, it just has a very uh, it, it feels familiar um, to Windows users and and so forth, uh, and so uh, and, and Mac users as well. So uh, you know Mac users they have a, a terminal. There's a, a shell that you can issue uh, commands with and. Uh, you can write in a scripting language if you want. Like, I don't know if it's Bash or not. Uh, if the the shell is Bash, um, but it's uh, close enough, right? <laughs> um, and so uh, the terminal in uh, Ubuntu is going to feel very similar to that. Uh, and I guess you would get that with any um, with any Linux uh, operating system. Uh, but the the GUI. It, it's very friendly. Uh, so if it's your first foray into Linux, uh, Ubuntu is really good. And then I've used Ubuntu Server as well uh, and had a lot of success with that. So even if you're not using it um, as a like for your desktop or, or your laptop, uh, if you're using it as a server, uh, Ubuntu is pretty good as well. So uh, that's my recommendation if you're uh, just getting started in Linux. Um, Okay, uh, so Python. Um, Python, uh, I've I've done some stuff in Python, uh, and it can be really cool. Uh, in particular, there's a, a library called uh, NumPy uh, that just has uh, a lot of mathematics stuff on it. So, uh, if you're looking for something free uh, to work in, then uh, you can use NumPy. But there is a, a bit of ramp up. You're going to spend a, a fair amount of time. Know, just learning the ropes of it um, and that's fine there's there's no way around it like I said you're <laughs> you're gonna end up uh, you're gonna be burning quite a few hours uh, trying to catch up and, and get started in these um, so uh, I, I would recommend um, you know if you have a project that you want to jump into uh, then um, like a, a math specific project uh, that you want to jump into then Python is an option uh, I haven't used R, so I can't comment on that. I have used MATLAB, uh, and uh, MATLAB's pretty cool as well. It has a, a lot of really cool features built into it. Um, but again, uh, for me, whenever I've uh, tried to learn, um, I've always needed a project uh, to, to kind of challenge me and uh, sort of direct my efforts so that I'm not just reading the entire manual I have uh, you know, something like a game, I guess, right? Like where uh, there's a, you know, there's these predefined objectives, uh, and you can kind of try and check your way through them. And uh, whenever you're you've finished all the objectives, then uh, you know, you, then you can either level up and try something harder, or uh, or you know, just revel in the achievement of of having completed all of your objectives. Um, so, but if you're if you're looking for uh, a math library that you can use, you know, to program in, uh, then uh, this is one option. Uh, and so, like I said, Python uh, can be really cool. Uh, Python, uh, so Python has is not without its own peculiarities. Uh, so uh, there's uh, all of these versions, right? And again, I said that the major version, when this first number changes, a lot of stuff can break. So Python had this enormous user base, and they were all working on Python 2.7. Uh, and uh, they realized 
uh, sometime, uh, I want to say it was back around 2000, but I don't remember exactly when it was, uh, they realized that, well, you know, they're really hemming themselves in by restricting integers to 4 bytes and longs to 8 bytes. What would be really nice is if uh, they just uh, went all out went all out and uh, made the integers uh, 24 bytes uh, so that you could represent uh, <laughs> these enormous numbers, right? Uh, just out of the box with these 24 byte integers. Uh, and longs, I think 32 bytes or uh, 36 bytes, I can't remember what it is. Uh, and then floating point and uh, double precision uh, representations uh, can be even longer. Uh, and they have this decimal type uh, where you can specify the amount of precision you want. Uh, and so it was it was really smart um, in uh, in that they uh, they eliminated you know, this possibility of overflow. So out of the box, they provide you with these features that uh, no longer restrict you to uh, the way the numbers are are represented. So you can't. Uh, you can't go all the way to infinity, obviously, because you can't go all the way to infinity. Uh, but uh, they um, they got around a lot of those just built-in limitations uh, and just uh, tried to future-proof it. Uh, and in doing so, uh, they they broke everything. <laughs> so uh, so that's why even though they're on 3.9, uh, there's still a lot of stuff that. Uh, can only run on Python 2.7 and I think NumPy is restricted to Python 2.7 um, but eventually everything is going to, to move forward to Python 3 or Python 4 whenever that comes out uh, and it'll all get moving um, but uh, if you're going to use Python just uh, you know beware that there is that whole thing going on so uh, Okay, well, so maybe uh, maybe you just want to stick to uh, the other programming languages for now, right? Uh, so you can do uh, a fair amount of stuff with C and C++ and Java and uh, C Sharp and JavaScript. Um, but, uh, you know, there are people that swear by Python as well. So, uh, you know, it, it, I've, again, I, I've used it uh, to some success, so... Um, you know, uh, feel free to explore that as well. Okay, uh, so VirtualBox. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I don't think I had a, a desktop until my senior year uh, as an undergraduate. Uh, and so um, when I finally got one, I had to choose whether to work in Windows uh, or uh, work in Linux. Uh, I couldn't afford a Mac. I got priced out by Mac. It was, it was just too expensive for me. Uh, so I built a desktop and then I ended up uh, installing Linux on my machine uh, and just dealing with the discomforts and, and forcing my way to use it. Uh, and you know it's <laughs> it is a little like uh, going uh, to study abroad in order to learn a, a foreign language. Uh, it's uncomfortable, and then you get used to it, and, and then it's just kind of second nature. Um, so that was my uh, experience in, in how to become familiar with Linux, and then I ended up not using it until, um, I don't know, like seven years into my career or something like that. Uh, but uh, with VirtualBox, and, and this is free software, um, you can, uh, so you install it on your machine, and uh, and then you can create a virtual machine. So it'll it'll allocate. Uh, I recommend using a fixed disk size. So it'll uh, create a file, whatever size you say. So if you have a, a two terabyte hard drive or something, and you allocate you know, 64 gigs, then it'll create this 64 gig file on your uh, on your hard drive. Uh, and then it'll use that as storage space. So it'll it'll pretend to be a hard drive, uh, essentially, um, which is is pretty cool. But uh, and then you can uh, install something like Ubuntu if you want to try Ubuntu, uh, or you know some other flavor of Linux if you want, uh, onto that virtual machine, um, and. Uh, 
yeah uh, and so you can get started on doing that you'll have to mount it as a virtual disk uh, or you'll have to burn it to CD uh, in order to do that uh, and so there is um, software to uh, mount ISOs as virtual disks um, although I'm not gonna make a recommendation on that at the moment but uh, you know feel free to, to Google that if, if you've never done it uh, so um, you download the .iso file and then uh, there's some software that you can use and uh, say okay well I want this file to pretend to be a, a DVD drive um, and then it'll it'll do the work for you it'll mount it uh, the file and then you can access it just like it's a DVD drive um, so uh, so the whole experience is uh, you know it, it's pretty good to go through the motions and, and you know do it uh, with no pressure um, and uh, that'll allow you that if you have um, a Windows machine then you can use it to explore Linux um, and then uh, I don't know if they have oh yeah they do uh, so there's a an OS X version as well so if you're on OS X and you want to toy with uh, Linux then you can do that uh, I think uh, you can uh, OS X or uh, Mac OS, whatever they're going by now, uh, they um, they also have, I, I believe, Parallels, which is their virtual machine software. Uh, and so I don't know how that works in comparison to this. Um, my experience with Macs uh, is limited to uh, about a two-year run uh, professionally, uh, so uh, not a, a great deal of experience, um, but. Uh, I do know that you can't install a virtual machine of Mac OS on Windows, uh, and uh, that's uh, that's because of um, so uh, Mac OS looks for uh, certain hardware markers, uh, so that'll only run on uh, machines with the the approved hardware. So even though it's running on on the same architecture, right? So AMD 64 or x86, uh, it um, it it's specially branded essentially uh, and the operating system won't uh, run otherwise um, but uh, if you if you can't work on a Mac uh, and you do still kind of want to get a feel for it uh, Linux is uh, kind of a, a halfway point between Windows and Mac uh, where you can still you know get a feel for um, for navigating the file system and and so forth uh, but uh, it it has its own peculiarities, so Linux, I won't go so far as saying that Linux is a, a good substitute for learning how to work with a Mac. Um, you know, Apple um, they uh, they have a, a lot of restrictions, uh, and uh, in in that regard, they're kind of leading the way uh, in terms of um, in terms of securing applications and, and ensuring. Uh, the integrity of, of the application that's actually being installed uh, and so from the standpoint of the user um, it, uh, it it makes sure that it's almost impossible for a user to install a virus uh, which is is excellent um, in terms of development it makes <laughs> it, it it adds a significant uh, amount of uh, effort necessary uh, in order to develop against it. Um, so uh, that is the counter argument to whenever I was saying that um, uh, the eighty percent, right, going after the eighty percent and learning to develop your applications in HTML. Uh, well, if you want to specialize, uh, if you want to be uh, the um, the aficionado or, or the the expert in terms of uh, working with Mac, uh, then uh, it's it's probably not a bad idea to start uh, paying that toll now and uh, and learning what it takes uh, in order to write an, uh, to build an application uh, that you can publish to the Mac Store, um, and it's uh, it's it's a fair amount of effort. Um, you have to get a developer. Um, it's not a license, but you have to get a, a developer certificate. Uh, you have to learn how to code sign your work. Uh, you have to learn uh, their uh, their languages. Uh, I think it's 
Swift uh, and Objective C. I think those are the two. Um, but uh, again, I'm I'm not an expert. Uh, the work that I did developing against Mac was actually done in JavaScript. Uh, I used Electron, uh, and uh, that's uh, it's uh, uh, it, it builds on top of uh, the Chromium uh, base, or whatever, uh, and so it's like this really lightweight weight version of Chrome, uh, a Chrome engine essentially, uh, that allows you to run. Uh, JavaScript as a desktop application uh, and so uh, I was able to write an application that would support website code and desktop application code at the same time uh, and so that was that's, <laughs> that experience is part of why I'm uh, such a an advocate of JavaScript and then you know some of the other stuff that you can do with it that we'll get into a little later in the semester so, uh, so yeah, uh, there you have it. If you want to specialize, then um, you know there's there's going to be a market for that as well. Uh, and again, it's it's because Mac uh, or you know Apple goes so far in terms of securing the process. Uh, they they try to make it impossible to install a virus for the common user, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, but as the developer, uh, again, it, it adds a significant amount of overhead in terms of uh, just learning how to do it. Uh, but, you know, as I've been saying, uh, it's all just work, right? So it, uh, it's, it's time, but, um, you know, it's, it's still an investment. Okay, so uh, this will allow you to support uh, and additional operating system on top of you know whatever it is your laptop or desktop uh, and it's pretty cool um, but it's not compatible with docker uh, and so docker is a containerization approach uh, so uh, the VM supports an, a copy of an operating system on top of your your existing one uh, docker um, it uh, uh, it knows how to borrow what's already there, uh, if, if that makes sense. So it provides um, uh, you're essentially uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, okay, so uh, whereas a, a virtual machine, it gives you the entire operating system. Docker tries to keep it as simple and lightweight as possible. So this was built with cloud computing in mind. Uh, and the idea that you might have to create uh, additional instances on the fly to support uh, a spike in traffic and, and so forth. Uh, and so in order to do that, um, and in order to minimize load times, uh, it, the, the container needs to be as lightweight as possible. And so uh, they, they searched for a way and, and they came up with what I think is a pretty clever solution uh, to um, to reuse the host operating system's libraries uh, so that it can be this really lightweight um, you know facade of an operating system uh, and so it's it's really only uh, what you ask for and, and not a lot more and so the file sizes are really small it's really cheap to copy it around in a, a cloud environment uh, it's really uh, fast to, to spin it up and uh, and not terribly costly to get rid of it either uh, since the footprint is so light. So whereas a, a virtualized operating system, so a VM, a virtual machine, uh, would take you know, uh, somewhere between like 6 and 10 gigabytes uh, of storage space, uh, a Docker container uh, could be as small as you know, like 20 megabytes or, or something like that. Uh, and so it's a significantly lighter file um, and it, uh, it it's better suited for the cloud environment. Um, however, uh, it it's uh, it's even more headless than a headless server. <laughs> um, you uh, it, it it can be uh, pretty difficult um, if you're not familiar uh, to to just debug it uh, because there's uh, not really it's not a, a running operating system so you can't uh, 
open a, a secure shell connection to it or a terminal into it. Um, you have to uh, to kind of work at it a little bit to find out uh, if it's not working. You know, if, if something's going wrong inside of it, uh, how how to deal with that, how to manage it. Um, so if, if you know an expert in Docker, uh, you know, uh, buy them a pizza, get them to teach you what they can, uh, and and to teach you the the tricks uh, in order to to get moving on it. Um, I'll see if I can uh, set something up uh, for this, but um, no promises that, that I'll get it done this semester. Uh, a future class might benefit from it, but uh, I, I can't promise that I'll get to it for you. Um, but uh, as far as like cloud software development, uh, there's an excellent chance that you'll you'll end up working with Docker. Uh, and so again, these these two are exclusive, and it's because uh, you have to enable um, a virtualization setting in the BIOS uh, on your computer, and then Windows will make a decision based on whether that's set or or not, whether it's enabled or, or disabled, uh, and uh, if it's enabled, uh, then you can run uh, VirtualBox, uh, and if it's disabled, then you can run Docker. Uh, but they are mutually exclusive. Um, so if you're if you're completely unfamiliar with Linux and, and you favor learning that, uh, then perhaps you want to favor VirtualBox. Um, if you're uh, you know looking for an internship and and you're ready to roll, uh, then maybe you want to you know uh, set up Docker and then work through some of the, the getting started tutorials there and that might be enough um, but this is again it's a placeholder it's a, a facade for an operating system this isn't a uh, while there is uh, some development work necessary in order to build the container and, and set up building the container uh, you still have to master a programming language. Uh, now it, you get to choose, to Docker's credit, you can choose whatever you want. Anything that would work on the operating system will work in the Docker container, um, but you still have to learn one of the languages, right? Uh, okay, so uh, okay, so we'll do two coding efforts uh, and then uh, we will um, we'll call it a day. Uh, okay, so uh, I, uh, I'm really big at uh, just coding these little math challenges uh, to try and figure out how to move back and forth between what you read in a book uh, and what you, you type out to a, a program to get it to run. Uh, just it's, um, it's just practicing translating, so translating between math speak and some programming language. Um, and then, you know, hopefully, if you if you practice enough languages, uh, programming languages, then you can easily move back and forth between them, uh, or you can pick one up and, and use that as your language of the day. Uh, yeah. So, um, but JavaScript is is ever at hand, <laughs> so we'll use that. Um, okay, so I don't know what that is. Let's clear it. Okay, yeah, some issues. Uh, okay. So, uh, so Newton's method is used to uh, approximate square roots. Um, it can be used for other types of roots, uh, but you're not guaranteed uh, convergence with other types of roots. Uh, and so square roots, because there is just the one uh, on the real number line, um, the positive real number line, uh, it, it it will converge. Um, so, uh, okay. Uh, so for these, um, so it, it's pretty simple. You just iterate. You see this uh, recursive uh, action here, uh, and whenever you see this, this n and n plus one, these indices, you should be thinking uh, for loop, um, and uh, we can do that. And then there's also these function definitions, and so this requires uh, remembering calculus and, <laughs> and actually doing this by hand. So we need to define f of x, so we'll define some function f, which takes in a parameter x, uh, and returns 
the square. Right? So that's the f of x that we're discussing. Oh, actually, uh, no, that's not true because we want it uh, to equal zero. We want some function that equals zero. So the score, the function we want is actually um, f of x minus the squared value. And we'll change this to say approximation, right? Because over here we see that it's taking um, the the previous guess, right? So the previous approximation is always the input. So we'll say the approximation is the first input, and uh, the squared value is the second input. Uh, and then on the bottom in the denominator uh, we have the derivative of f of x um, so we'll say df uh, and that uh, when we take the derivative uh, you'll remember that this this is x squared uh, and so that becomes 2x and this is a constant so that goes away it becomes zero it does not vary as with respect to changes in x, right? So that's why constants disappear. So then this one, uh, we can use the notation, right? But we'll still use approximation to show that it's the same value that's coming in over here. Uh, and that's two times the approx times the approximation. Right. Uh, so now. Uh, we can uh, write our loop, right? So our square root, uh, and again, you can see that this is square roots because uh, our function is squared and uh, we have it over here. Uh, but we could use the same method uh, to find cube roots and uh, uh, quartic roots and, and so forth. Uh, but due to their nature, um, it, you uh, might not get the root that you're expecting, right? So you would expect to get a set of roots with those functions. Uh, and then in order to do it properly, as you honed in on one, you would have to uh, do some polynomial arithmetic and, and divide out that root set. If you started with a quartic, once you identified a root, uh, you performed the polynomial division and then you, you went down to some cubic function and then with the next root you went down to a quadratic and, and so forth. Um, okay. Uh, so then uh, the square root function accepts uh, some value x, right? Uh, but uh, over here we have x, right? So uh, we'll just say squared value here. That's our input. So we're going to be maintaining this running x sub n, right? That becomes our input. Uh, but uh, you know, it's going to be the approximation every time. So our initial guess is the input variable, and then uh, our guess gets better with each iteration. Uh, and then the choice of 10 here, uh, I just want to show that the method actually converges pretty quickly. Uh, and so we'll just do uh, 10 iterations to show how close we can get to the, the built-in square root function. Uh, and then you can see that you know, this is uh, a pretty good method for finding square roots. Right? Uh, and then uh, the reason that's so important is that whenever you get to statistics and you start uh, doing um, the square root of air functions, right, or, or your air function is defined as the square root of the uh, differences squared, <laughs> the sum of the differences squared, right, uh, then uh, Newton's method, uh, you know, is, is kind of applied in that method to um, 
to get successive approximations that are closer you know, to your input. Um, and so we'll, uh, I'll discuss that later. It seems a little too abstract, and uh, I don't want to uh, <laughs> you know, uh, just pump out too much noise in terms of the, the thoughts that I'm sharing at the moment. But, um, but what I'm getting at is that this method, uh, whenever you get to optimization problems uh, or uh, problems where you're trying to minimize an error, uh, you use an abstraction of this method. So it's, it's more than just this trivia for finding square roots. It's, um, it's very much used in, in the higher levels of uh, mathematics and data analysis and, uh, and optimization. Okay. Uh, so then the next approximation is the previous approximation minus the ratio f of x divided by its derivative at that same point. Uh, and then we want to see, we want to watch it converge. So we're going to write it out to the console. Turn that result. To square root of two, we get this as our result. And if we were to use the built-in function, uh, which uses Newton's method, uh, then uh, we would see that that they go just a little bit further. So, uh, so if we wanted we can modify our square root function uh, and we could try and go further. I don't know if we're going to run into underflow here, but let's put this at 20 iterations and see what we get. Uh, okay, so we're still getting this cutoff uh, and that's going to have to do with the uh, precision. So you see how we keep getting the same number? So we get that 5, 1 and then it truncates back and then we get the 5, 1 and so forth. Um, so we're dealing with underflow here where um, the representation, whether it's 64 bits or, or 32 bits, I, I can't remember by default. Uh, I, I want to say every every number is a 64 bit uh, double, uh, a double precision floating point and a uh, floating point number. Um, so 64 bits. Um, and it, it just can't get any closer than that. Uh, and so uh, when we try to get closer, uh, it'll, it'll deal with some rounding issues. Uh, and so we keep oscillating back and forth. Um, so the limitation there is in how we represent the number in memory and, and the fact that we're limited to eight bytes of representation. Um, but the method itself converges pretty quickly. Uh, so it gets to that, it gets to maximal precision uh, by the fifth iteration, which is fantastic. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, that is excellent convergence. So given how many digits of precision there are, it's, that's fantastic. Uh, okay, uh, so that was Newton's method. Uh, and again, you'll use this if you do a lot in statistics or optimization. Um, or uh, <laughs> training of neural nets <laughs> or whatever. Um, so it, it comes up, it, it comes up again. Um, okay, uh, so then I promised that we would go back and we would solve that initial problem, right? So, um, right, so this was our, uh, our tree. So uh, a full binary tree of height two uh, with the numbers it counting up by five, right? So 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, and 35. Right? Uh, okay, so uh, okay, so let's find a way to represent it. We'll traverse it, uh, and then we'll we'll call it a day. Uh, okay, so we need a way to create a node, right? So create a binary node. It's got a value. Uh, yeah. So 
this is a function uh, and it returns an object and the object has a value and that value is going to be value uh, but uh, ES6 ECMA script standard 6 came out in 2016 or 2015 whatever um, it allows a shortcut that if the variable name is the same as the key uh, the, or if the value is assigned from a variable that is the same name as the key for this dictionary uh, then you can just use the shorthand and it'll expand it to that uh, so we'll use the shorthand uh, to try and familiarize, help you learn the features of, of modern JavaScript. Uh, okay, uh, and then there's going to be a left child, which is null, uh, and a right child, which defaults to null. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, that's it. That's really all we need. Uh, okay, so our root to be five. It's gonna have the value five. Uh, so then uh, we'll just name our uh, our variables after the number that they hold. Right? So uh, node ten. Uh, So we've created the nodes, now we need to define the relationships. So this is, uh, I mean, this should look familiar if you've been doing the LaTeX files. So the first thing you do is create the vertices, and then you define the relationships between the vertices, whether you're building a graph or whether you're building a, a tree. It's the order that we go in. Uh, so root that left child is 10. is 15. Uh, and then 10's child, children, uh, the left child is 20. And its right child is 25. And then 15 has a left child of 30. And a right child of 35. Uh, okay, so root has a left child of 10, which has a left child of 20, and a right child of 25, and then right child, let's see, the right child of 5 is 15, yeah, so value 15, and 15 has a left child of 30, and a right child of 35. Okay, so we've made our assignments correctly, and we have root, uh, so now we need a method of uh, traversing it. Uh, so we're going to first do um, pre-order, uh, in order, and post order. So you can see where that happens, uh, and then um, and then we'll do the uh, and 
that's the equivalent of a, a depth first search uh, or uh, a depth first traversal and then we'll uh, do breadth first and hopefully we'll finish this pretty quickly uh, okay so uh, whenever you're dealing with an indefinite loop uh, your your two choices are a while loop um, or a recursive function uh, recursive functions can lead to stack overflows um, which you know uh, I, I guess would be better than an actual infinite loop <laughs> where uh, nothing ever went wrong it just never terminated um, so stack overflows have their purpose uh, or but um, but if it's algorithmically correct the loop is probably the better option um, but uh, yeah sure let's let's throw it on a a stack. We'll do the function method. Uh, okay. So uh, let uh, our uh, our visit function uh, it visits the descendants uh, and then it takes a, a node and a um, an order. Uh, okay, so then um, if oh. Uh, and it also takes a uh, callback function, we'll say CB. Uh, so if we're looking at uh, pre-order, uh, then we do our callback function here, uh, and we pass the node. Uh, okay, so we've gotten that out of the way. Uh, so then, uh, now we look at the left child. So if node.leftchild is not equal to null, uh, but JavaScript actually allows us to use a shorthand, uh, and we can just say uh, this will also automatically test not equal to no, null. Uh, so node.leftchild. Uh, then we'll visit the descendants of the left child. And we'll pass it that child. It's going to use the same order traversal and it's going to use the same callback function. Uh, okay. So then uh, this is a peculiarity of binary trees uh, that you can have an in-order traversal. Uh, so then if order equals in-order, then we call back the current node. Uh, and then we check the right child. That's not null. Then we visit the descendants. Uh, or something that doesn't quite spell descendants. descendants. Alright, well, I'll scream at me if that's wrong. Node that right child order callback. Uh, and then uh, if the order is post order, then we call back here. Right, so we were able to do all three implementations uh, in a single function using this one. Uh, so let's see whether or not that's going to work. <laughs> uh, failure is always a possibility. Uh, okay, so our callback uh, is our uh, visitor function. Uh, and so we're only ever passing it a node, right? So uh, we already know its signature. It's going to accept a node. Uh, and all it's going to do is log the value. OK. 
Okay. Uh, so then if we call visit descendants and we pass it root and pre-order and our visitor callback. Then it uh, does the pre-order traversal, which always uh, goes, it prints it out as it visits and it goes down the left child first, right? So then it visits the right child only when the left branch returns. Um, in order. Right? Um, right, so between the left and the ch right child, it prints it out. Uh, and so this would be the sorted order for a binary search tree, and we'll probably discuss that more next time. Uh, and post order. Uh, okay, so none of those were what we were looking for. Um, so now, uh, so each of these was a, a depth first search uh, where uh, you follow one branch until it ends, until, until you reach the end of the road, and then you backtrack and and then you follow some other uh, uh, path, <laughs> connected path or whatever. Um, and so this is traversing a tree. It's going to be very similar to traversing a graph or uh, creating a, a spanning tree out of a graph. Uh, and we'll, again, discuss that more next time. Uh, okay, so then that wasn't what we were looking for. Then what's the, the function that we're looking for? Uh, so this was uh, depth first. Uh, what we really want is a breadth first traversal. Um, so let visit breadth first. Uh, and so this accepts a root. We're not going to call it recursively. Uh, and we're going to maintain a queue. going to initialize it with the root. Uh, so while q.length is greater than zero, uh, and JavaScript is also going to allow us, uh, and in fact C allows this shortcut as well, uh, to do that, and it's the same as this. So uh, actually it's the same as this, but um, just as well. Uh, okay, so we're going to use the shorthand. So while q.length, so while there's something in our queue, uh, and the JavaScript, <laughs> we use array, an array doubles as both a stack and a queue. Uh, it provides push and pop, uh, but it doesn't uh, provide uh, in queue and DQ, it provides uh, shift, uh, well, and unshift shifts everything to the right. So what we're going to use is push and shift as our, our two operations. Uh, and push is our in queue and shift is our DQ. Uh, and that's just a, a peculiarity of, of JavaScript. Um, so, uh, if you want, you can modify the prototype <laughs> to, to support NQ and DQ, um, but we'll leave it alone for now. Uh, okay, so then uh, while we have something in there, then our next node is uh, whatever was at the front of the queue. So queue.shift. Okay. Uh, so that'll remove from the front of the line. So it'll, on the first pass, it'll take root and it'll assign it to next node. And it modifies Q so that there's nothing in the Q. Uh, so then we're going to see, uh, and uh, if you're dealing with something more than a, a binary tree, so something where you don't explicitly define left child and right child, but you define a children collection, then you would use a loop. But because we're explicitly defining them, we're just going to use an if. Uh, a couple of if statements. So if next node has a left child, then we're going to push that onto the queue, or we're going to enqueue it using the push function.
Uh, and then uh, because we don't deal with anything else, like we're not recursively calling anything, we can uh, we can invoke our callback uh, before or after the if statements, and it's the same thing. So we'll just do it afterwards. Uh, okay, okay, uh, okay. So let's see if we broke everything uh, or if that works. So we have root and we have visit. Uh, okay, there we go. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. Uh, okay, so what we did is uh, we queued this and then we removed it and then we decided and then we asked, okay, well, which children did it have? It has this one and this one. So then we spit out 5 and then on the next pass uh, we, uh, we remove this one, we say, okay, well, which children did it have? Uh, it has this one and this one. So then we say, okay, well, put this one at the end of the line, and then put this one at the end of the line. And so the next one in line, the next one in our queue, was this one. And we say, okay, well, what children did 15 have? Well, it has this one and this one. So we say, okay, well, to the end of the line with the left child, and then to the end of the line with the right child. Okay, well, the next in line after this one was this one. Right? You can check the tape if you need to. Uh, so this one doesn't have any children, so we don't do anything. We just print it out. This one doesn't have any children, so we just print it out. This one doesn't have any children, so we just print it out. This one doesn't have any children, so we just print it out. So the breadth first method, and I imagine we'll see it again when we do our spanning trees, um, is the way to traverse a tree level by level. So instead of going all the way down either the left branch or all the way down the right branch or whatever, you do it level by level, and that's breadth first. And to do that, you just uh, you maintain a queue as you go, and then you have your callback function that does whatever you want when you get to a node. Right? Uh, and so it separates out the whatever you want from the method of actually traversing the tree. Uh, and so that's the beauty of callbacks. Uh, okay, I'm like 10 minutes over. so. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll blow off some class later this semester. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, yeah, uh, have a good evening, and uh, don't forget to check in and start on the homework. Uh, and yeah, there isn't a homework due today, so uh, don't forget to start on homework three. Okay.